Well, we had to leave it right in the middle of an argument, so let's get right back into it, shall we? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. So listen to last week to understand the, the heavy potent uh, that these, these words have. Uh, pot they're potent words and they carry portent. How's that? Here I, here I am to do your will. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. We do that with wills. We find the latest will. And sometimes it takes a while and there are court cases to figure out the latest valid will. And so we understand that. And here Jesus has died and now he is instituting, he is uh, enforcing the will. And it's a different will than the one that came down the mountain with Moses. It is not opposed to the old law. It is not in rebuke to the old law. The old law was bringing us to this place. And now that we have Christ, we don't turn around and kick the old law away and kick the stories. And, and by for goodness sake, we certainly don't get rid of the Jews. They are our brothers and sisters. We don't, it's a different will. It's a will that spreads out the love rather than narrows it. So what happens? By that will, we have been made holy. Well, tense is important. Are you holy? Well, I've heard a lot of sermons that tell me I'm supposed to be. Here's the good news. You are. Just act like it. Uh, you know, you're married, act like it. You're, you're old, act like it. You know, be who you're supposed to be. Uh, this is, I can remember being in college and I was a very naive person because I was in university very, very young. And I can remember we took a break during a class and we all go out to the, the, the larger area from off of which the classrooms um, lead. And there are the soda machines and the snack machines. And of course we're hitting that stuff just you know, going at it like mad, trying to get something. And as, as I do, one of the men that was in the class with me was a bit older than the other students. He was, he was actually quite old. He was probably 30, you know, almost dirt. And a, a pretty girl walked by. It was a hot day. She wasn't wearing a lot, and, but she was certainly within the legal limits. And she walks by and he just kind of does the whole lean and look and um, you know, this is back in the 70s, kids, uh, and you know, we had not, uh, society had not grown as well as it could have and should have. Uh, so I looked at him and I was going, Bleh. and again, naive take, first words out of my mouth. I said, but you're married. And he laughed a little bit and he goes, but I'm not dead. My first thought again came out of my mouth and that was, that can be changed both the being married and the not dead part. I didn't understand why would you do that if you, you have somebody and you are pledged to them and them to you. I mean, that should solve the whole problem. I didn't get the world. And I would later learn uh, to my chagrin, depression, all of that sort of thing, what the world was like. Here, well, we are holy act like it. it it is amazing yeah and the bible does say be holy but it's just it's kind of like be filled with the spirit and he's talking to christians you already have the spirit yeah you just need to remember that fill yourself up with that we, uh, peter and in the, in the epistles of peter he says you already know everything i'm going to tell you but i need to set you in remembrance of these things okay well Again, we are holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, once for all. And how exciting is that? How, it sounds like good news. I think we should call Hebrews a gospel because it is just full of good news. And it's Christ-centered, so not a biography by any stretch, but it's kind of like another gospel. Not a competing gospel, <laughs> but an affirming one. Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands. If you notice, he just keeps hitting that. It just goes on and on and on. 
Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has, he has made perfect those who are being made holy. So it's kind of like salvation. I know when I was saved and I know that I am still being saved. Uh, being holy, I know I am holy and I know he is making me holy. These things that we look upon sometimes as events or accomplishments are really in God's eyes and they should be in ours. A process, a lifelong process, because that's the way it's supposed to be. So in just a few verses, he made everybody holy, and now he's making you holy. Isn't that cool? So we're safe to get better. We're safe to learn, to wrestle with God until we gain greater understanding. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. He's already used these verses. The writer of Hebrews will repeat verses because trying to drive home an argument. This is out of Jeremiah 31, 33 is where you should really look. Chapter 31, 33. And then he adds, uh, same passage. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Although we are still sinning, um, why, why doesn't he, why don't we have to do the sacrifices if we're still sinning? I mean, we're no better than any of the Jews were that were wandering with Moses. I think we could all agree there that we're no better than the patriarchs and our families. We're no better than the post Canaanite, you know, um, entrance or conquest. We're no better than those people. So why did they have to sacrifice and we don't? Because Jesus came and instituted the new covenant that had been promised for a very, very long time. And in that covenant, he is the one who has sacrificed and he sacrificed himself that is once for all, for all sins. There is no need for any more sacrifice. So when I sin then, is it completely neutral? I can just I can just go out and sin. Well, no, no. I need to remember the reality, the stink, and the hurt, and the, the horror of sin, and I need to form myself more after Christ. He is drawing us by love, however, not by fear. A lot of people have been baptized out of fear. A lot of people go to church out of fear. God, God will take what you will give him, but he would much prefer that we respond to his love. We, we are now saved. It's, we're free from sin and we're free to act like good, loving people without the burdens that people throw on you. Can you imagine how badly we've missed this? And so, so many people, you know, have just enough religion to make them miserable. And they have all these rules and all of these, the detritus of centuries. It's like you don't even have the ship anymore. It's just a bunch of barnacles. We need to pull that thing back, strip it off, see what Jesus has done for us, and go live accordingly. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, I, I got to stop again. I know this could be annoying, but I had a feeling that if this was terribly annoying, you would have quit listening to midweek Bible classes a long time ago. We have a solid core of about two to 300 every week. It is by far the least listened to and shared thing we do, but I still think it's probably kind of important. So you can let me know what you think. Info at rsafeharbor.com or comments. But I love this. We have confidence to enter the most holy place. You know, I think there's a place for falling on your face and tears and sobs racking. I think there's a place for that. But that's not the way God wants us to feel about approaching him all the time. 
We should have confidence. He promised, he told us who he was, he did what he said he was gonna do, and he promised us, he, was, he has made us holy, taking care of our sins, and we're free now. So it's kind of insulting to keep going back to God in prayer as timid little mice, terrified, saying the wrong thing. You know, I um, I don't think I would react well to that. If somebody every time came up with a question, you know, I know you're so busy, and you know, Doctor Me, this, that, and the other, and you're just, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to bother you, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm friendly, and I say you don't have to call me Doctor. I'm not an MD. You know, just call me Patrick, and you know, what's your question? I got time. We can do this. We'll do an email, whatever we can do. And then tomorrow you come back. Oh, you know, I know you're busy. After a few times, that shtick gets old. I said shtick, it's a Yiddish word. That whole act is what it means. Gets really old. Why do, you, why do we think that's what God wants? Well, I would recommend against getting your theology from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, a very old film, by the way, guys. If you love that film, be aware that your grandkids and kids probably have never heard of it. But there are scenes in there which do border on the sacrilegious. There's no question. But a scene which has always impressed me, where the monks that are walking down the road and they are holding these wooden tablets, probably icons of sort, maybe some sort of a writing upon them, and they are chanting a prayer and every so often they whack themselves in the head with the board. And God appears and tell one, one of tell, uh, Terry Gilliam's um, cartoon cut out things and says, what are you doing? And, you know, they fall down and, you know, they're, they're looking like this. And he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, we're averting our eyes, O Lord. And he says, stop it. They had a point. They did. Have a look at the prayers in the scripture. And you're going to find people boldly going to God and sometimes at God and sometimes bargaining with God and sometimes getting God to move the number. We can go boldly because Christ said we could. That's, that's special. In speaking to law enforcement, a few times I've spoken to groups of people that had to be very, very protected from any outsider eyes. These are undercover agents in this country and overseas. And when they had their, their gatherings to do um, the necessary education to be better at their job, they have often called me in. And I said often, that's probably the wrong word. I think I have done these maybe eight or nine times. And, you know, where you're walking into a SCIF, it's a secure communications device. And, you, know, you have to put everything away. No cell signal gets in, no Wi-Fi. And no eyes that will then later say, I saw this guy and he's an ARC, or I saw this guy and he's an undercover. You can't do that. So I walked into where I was told to come uh, and it was a hotel. I'm not gonna give any specifics. And immediately two large men that, um, these men had gone to the gym, let's just put it this way, in suits bracketed me front and I noticed somebody pulled up behind me in the middle and they said, who are you, sir? Can we help you? And I said, I'm gonna reach for my wallet now. Uh, watch my hands very carefully, please. And I pull out my ID. And my ID, by the way, was just a driver's license. I don't carry a badge, I don't have a badge. So driver's license. And I said, I've been asked to come to speak. I'm the keynote at, and I gave a certain time. And they said, would you walk with us, please? You know, what are you gonna say? Nah, I don't want to. No, you're gonna walk with them. Uh, it's up to you. You can walk with your feet touching the ground or not. So I walked with them and they go into this little room. They took a picture. They made a couple phone calls. They sent this thing out, came back within uh, seconds. That's our guy, he's cool. Immediately, they slapped together an ID, put it around my neck and they said, please sir, do not remove this. And I'm thinking there is no chance in the world I'm gonna remove this. But that little thing around my neck, I noticed every time I entered a room, people looked at it. And once they saw by the writing on it, that not only was I allowed to be there, but I was an instructor, everything changed. Because I was there courtesy of this particular state police organization or this particular federal 
organization. And because they saw that, I was allowed in. I didn't have to prove myself anymore. I didn't have to tell anybody what I've seen, done. I didn't have to show them photocopies of past works, degrees, papers, nothing. Because I had the imprimatur of the official body granting me authority to be in any room I wanted to be in anytime. Now that's a rare enough experience for me that I'm still wowed by it. As Christ, brothers and sisters, we got the badge, we got the lanyard and, and the little ID thing. Go into heaven and don't apologize for being there. Talk to your father, just talk to him. Doesn't even have to be a complete prayer. Although the, those that are gifted in prayer, I really love them because they've kept me alive and, and moving forward in my life. But you know, not everybody is. And sometimes it might be just like a kid talking to the dad, hop on subjects and then trailing off. That's okay. As a granddad, I gotta tell you, I love it. I absolutely love it. Even though I don't know half the time what they're talking about because they're talking about sports figures, they're talking to me. Now God, of course, knows what you're talking about. So go boldly. That's the point. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus, it's a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. So as the curtain separated the rest of the tabernacle from the Holy of Holies, Jesus stands between us and God. And what did he do? Pulled it open. He said, come on in. Be a part of this. Your home. This is your home. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And again, none of this is we're holy and you guys aren't. None of this is. It is he is holy and he has made us holy. Isn't it cool? Let's go love people. It's, it's what it is. And am I going to get really deep and theological here and grab all kinds of meaning out of the blood and the water? You can. You really can. But I don't think you need to. He already talked about the blood thing with Moses. And the water thing, everybody that was reading Hebrews or had Hebrews read to them knew about baptism. It was a ritual cleansing. It had been there since the, the tabernacle when they had the sea of brass and the, the priest had to cleanse themselves thoroughly before they went into the tabernacle proper and later the temple proper. And then outside there were the mikvahot. The mikvah is singular, uh, mikvahot is plural. The baptistries, many of them raised up, but most of them carved into the ground where you would go in, submerge yourself and come up the other side as a symbol of being cleansed or as a symbol of repentance or wishing for cleanliness or as a sign that you are dedicating yourself to a particular religious teacher. All of those were the use and you didn't have to declare before you went in. These were public spaces. So we do this. We have been baptized. We believe we have dedicated ourselves. We're going to go out there and love people in the name of Jesus. And he goes, verse 24, this is what he tells you. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let me talk to the ministers out there, the preachers, the pastors, the reverends. Do your sermons as a rule spur others on to love and good deeds or are they full of fear? Are they full of shame? Are they full of accusations? politics? Are they singing the company song rather than just saying the good news of Jesus? What are you spurring your congregation on to? Are your sermons more about money than they are about love? Oh, we need money. And those of you watching this, I bet a great portion of um, those watching the midweek Bible class are the kind of people that are supporting us, you know, a dollar, a hundred dollars, whatever it is, because you seem to be a very dedicated lot. I'll tell you that to show up here every week. 
and I'm very humbled by that. But we don't, while we ask for it and we tell you that we would love it, we don't push it and we're very, very clear that you don't have to give. If you are giving locally and you have limited, fi uh, you have limited finances, like what almost all of us do, then we get it, we get it. We're not putting this out to become rich because if we were, we're complete failures. But if we're putting it out to reach many people, especially the Monday morning messages in the worship are reaching a lot of people. So it's worth the effort. And when our bills are paid, what else, what else do you really need, right? But if our sermons are always about give me money, give me money because my Bentley is a year old and that's just a shame, that's a problem. If the minister lives richer than the bulk of the congregation, that could be a problem. And again, exceptions abound. You know, if I go over, if I was working, for example, in a third world country, I think I'd probably be living better than a bulk of the congregation. So I'm not doing a bulk, a blanket indictment. I'm just asking you to ask yourselves, what are the thrust, of, what's the thrust of your sermons? If I were to ask your people, and they had multiple choice, and one of them was the sermon spur us on to love and good works. Is that the box they'd check? Or, or would they say, not so much? I gotta tell you that I would have failed that test a lot in my life, and I'm hoping I don't fail it ever again. But that's something my community will have to hold me accountable for. And you're part of the community, part of the family. Come on in. I can say that because Jesus already said, come on in. Let us, cons I just love that. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. What was going on? They thought Jesus was coming back quickly and this time he'd be the Messiah they thought he was going to be last time. And so this time we would ride into Jerusalem, kick the Romans out, begin to expand the, the, the kingdom of Israel again as it was in the days of David. And that's what they're looking for. But now it's year 60 something. And so it's been a whole generation. It's been 30 plus years since Jesus ascended into heaven. And they thought it was gonna be right then. So some of them are losing hope. Some of them are giving up on the promise is later, the promise isn't now. Some of them are giving up on Jesus. And he's saying, don't give up, stay in the group. Now, I, I used to do this a lot, um, talking to youth groups and youth rallies, and I did a whole lot of that all the way up into my early 60s. Not so much now, and I get it. I do, I'm fine with that. But I would talk to the kids and I would explain how fragile a snowflake is. And people in the Northern lands know all about that. That is, a, you're a kid, first snow, you get really excited. You go out and you try to grab the snowflakes and you never can because they're so fragile. You grab, you open it up, there's a wee bit of water and that's it. Nothing seems to be as fragile as a snowflake. But if you put enough of them together, they'll stop a bulldozer. And I would tell them, Hey, little snowflake, stay with the group. Well, now the term snowflake has become politically charged. And once again, politics has reared its ugly head to ruin things. So I also used another illustration. I said, if you opened your front door and you saw a bunny, you go, oh, look at that. There's a wee bunny. That's a cute wee bunny, isn't it? Next day you open up the door, there are 50,000 bunnies. You're not gonna go, oh, cute bunny. You're gonna scream bunnies and you're gonna slam the door and call the cops, maybe the National Guard. Stay with each other. You're a lot bigger and tougher when you're with each other. It, it makes all the difference. The story is told, which is a preacher way of saying, pretty sure it never happened. The story is told of a minister who went to visit a member of his church who had not been around had not been attending for a while. And he went to say, is there something wrong? What can we do to encourage you? And the man said, well, you know, I am fine on my own with God. I worship God from right here in my chair. I pray to him. He and I have an understanding and, and I am fine here. I don't need to go to church. 
And without a word, the preacher looked over at the coals in the fire that were heating the room. He reached over and grabbed the tongs and he pulled one of the coals out that was red hot and he set it on the hearth. Without a word, they just watched it as it slowly lost the heat and went black and cold. And a man is supposed to, say, to have said, I understand, I'll be there Sunday, which is a great story. Pretty sure it never happened, but it's a good story. What does it mean? It means even the hottest coal will go cold if it's not around the other coals. You need the group. Now I'm an introvert. The old Myers-Briggs, which by the way had zero credibility psychologically, had no backing behind it. It was um, written by two ladies who had no psychological training. Uh, in fact, one of them wrote romance novels. But people loved it and it was a way, we always want to know a way that we can differentiate ourselves, right? And in that I always came up an INTJ, which is a very introverted, doesn't like to talk as, as off to the side. And everybody goes, ha ha ha, uh, they really missed you because you like to talk. Well, the only time you see me, I'm talking. But when I'm not working, I'm not talking. And I'm not hanging around people unless it's my work. And then I go out and do it because that's for Jesus. How could I hold that back after all he is doing and has done for me? That said, here we are so very different and I recharge being alone. I recharge in the quiet. However, if I do not have community, I will go cold. There are times that I have struggled and my faith has been hurt but I'm still there on the Sunday and I'm still supposed to speak and I will. And I'm up front about those weak times. And a song will be called for and the church will rise and sing. And it's not a song that I'm ready to sing yet, but listening to the group sing it gives me strength. It shores up my faith, helps me stay standing because I was in the group. I know me, um, I, I, I really do. And I fear that if I wasn't involved in the ministry, I would slowly go cold by staying away. So that's one of my disciplines actually, is to make myself stay in ministry so that I stay with the group. I gotta tell you, whatever it takes, do it. The group's important. This isn't a, a passage to be used against people like a club. Where were you Sunday? Well, my family was in town and we went camping. <gasps> you miss church? Well, first of all, they are the church. Second, I wish that they would have gathered with the larger body, but that doesn't mean what they did was sinful. Family's important. And how do you know but that they did not show love to each other and somehow affect others who saw that? They don't need, we don't need to be judging here, but I get it. When we lived in Colorado Springs, I. The competition every Sunday was the west side of our building because there's the front range, Pikes Peak, and it's gorgeous and beautiful. And so when people got a weekend, they've been working brutally hard. They wanted to hit the mountains. I got that. I did. I didn't like it. I wanted to see the numbers up. I wanted to see signs, physical signs of success. But the fact is, most of them were fine and they were back. They didn't go cold. They weren't separating. But just in case that's your habit, the writer of Hebrews says, get a different habit. Get with the group. Now, some of you are on your own sitting on the couch and you've been that way since before COVID. You were hurt by churches. You were drugged behind the truck of some church's theology and treatment of sinners like you. And you don't want to be in that group anymore. We'll be with this group. Write us, email us, patrick at rsafeharbor.com or the team at info at rsafeharbor.com. Let us know you're there. Let us know if, we need, if you need something we can supply. If you want me to show up on our welcome home tour. However, we make, it, make a connection. And while we have thousands that watch every week, we only know where hundreds are. You can let us know where you are. And you can even say, I don't want anybody to come by. And we will make a note 
will never happen. Or you can say, I'd like to know if there's somebody within an hour's drive. Maybe we can meet somewhere in a public place safely for lunch. We, we would love that because we need to group. We need to group. I meant to get a lot farther today, but I hope you've enjoyed our 30 minutes together. And that really concludes us for the, the long month of March with five Wednesdays. But we have gotten a big chunk of Hebrews out of the way. And I got to tell you, there are some amazing surprises and jaw-dropping moments yet to come. On that cliffhanger, I will leave you. Bless you. Cheers.